All right. So you've got, we're talking about um, St. Patty's Day rituals. So you've got the corned beef recipe. Um, what else do you have? Beer. Do you diet green? No. Are you 100% on only drinking Irish beer on the day? No. Oh. Okay. No, I think I think beer in general is living within the spirit of St. Patrick's law in my mind. <laughs> Plus, you know, if I'm going to have a, a bunch of corned beef, I don't know that I want a heavy Guinness. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't. And it, you know what? In Guinness, I don't care what people say. It's not the same here as it is. It's not the Dublin. same. It's not, not even close. Welcome to everybody to HR Unplugged. We are talking about our favorite St. Patrick's Day ritual. So come on in. Oh, baking with Guinness. Okay, Eleanor, mm. you've got to share with us your Guinness recipes. I'm going to make some of those. So tell us where you're from, what industry you're in, and your favorite St. Patty's ritual. You know, are you committed to green beer? Are you committed to only Irish beer, Irish whiskey? You know what? Tell us of what you've got going. We're T minus 10 days to the big event. Oh, cook my corned beef in a crock pot in Guinness. Now that's an now that's interesting. Norma. Beer bread, also good win. Okay, feel free to share your recipes. You know, we not only talk about jobs and, and things that are happening in our worlds and our Slack channel, but we can also include, <laughs> you know, recipes for all of our favorite holidays that are coming up. So feel free to put them in our Slack channel. And um, and with that, I think we'll go. Oh, yes. Irish coffees. We were just talking about. Yes. Those. Yes. Absolutely. That's what I'm you, having. Irish coffee. Yeah, and you don't have to wait for St. Patrick's Day for that. In fact, you probably shouldn't. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Irish soda bread. I love Irish soda bread. Irish kisses. I'm not sure what to say to that one. I'm sure we'll find out. You can also list that one in our Slack channel. <laughs> All right, we're going to get focused here on what we're here to do. And our poll for today is do HR leaders need a degree in HR to be successful? I want to see what you think about this. Brandon, what do you think about this question? Uh, well, I mean, I'm biased because I do not have a degree in HR. So I say uh, I, 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 I don't I don't think so. I mean, I'm curious to what what people think i know i know there there's there's always two sides to, uh, on on this and um yeah i, I don't know i go well, back and forth you go back and forth i go you back and forth I, I think because for me you know i studied in anthropology so it's not traditional hr program but it's also very connected to people and why people do the things they do and um, culture. And so, you know, there is an indirect, maybe even a more direct connection, but like the traditional HR track at a, at a four year, you know, I, I think there's some real benefit to that, but I don't think it, it's a make or break. This is interesting. Well, if we close out the poll and send the results back, 61% of you say no. You do not need a degree to be successful. Only 9% of you said yes. And 30% of you said yes, in some cases, no in others. So I think that's super interesting. I mean, I guess, you know, I'm going to take a picture of this so we can post it. But like in your last job description, did you say that you needed a degree as a requirement of the job? Probably not. Have you well, ever here, here, a degree as requirement of the job for HR, Brandon? Uh, I have, but it's been a while. I, I, I tend to think that's more of a, um, that, that's a little bit of an archaic way of thinking, but, but I think in some cases it, it's relevant. I think MBAs, right? Like when we're talking about degrees, I think MBAs are really valuable because as HR professionals, what I see set us apart is business acumen. I think somebody said that in here at business and um, which I wholeheartedly agree with. And, um, and so I think that is valuable, but I think we've probably all seen HR professionals that have those specific degrees that um, weren't great, to be honest. 
and those that didn't that were some of the best. So I, I don't I don't think the the piece of paper makes the person. Um, what I do think is this: like he, he, somebody said this to me a long time ago, and it kind of stuck with me. Um, having a degree might not open doors today the way it used to, but it likely will keep some doors from being closed. So I think I, I think that's a fair point. statement. I do too. I do too. Well, with that great wisdom, let's go ahead and get started here. We're excited. This is our 18th episode, and we're talking about how the state of HR can affect your career path. That's why we were curious about the certifications and wanted to hear everybody and their thoughts on that. We invite you to visit us at hrunplugged.com. You can view the latest episodes and series on demand. You can also sign up to be invited to future episodes. So subscribe to our series and we'll get you all the notices about what's coming up next. HR Unplugged is also available in podcast format. So you can sign up on your favorite podcast provider, Apple, Spotify, and listen to us there. And don't forget to get involved in our Slack community so we can all stay in touch in between episodes. All right, now let's get to the exciting part. I am so happy to have my partner in crime here, Brandon Welch, joining us. You know, I was preparing for this, Brandon, and I was thinking we've been on this journey together for eight years. Eight years. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's really, really cool. And so I'm really excited to have our community hear your voice on Career Path and HR. You've hired a lot of awesome HR professionals. You're one yourself. You have amazing experience in big companies, sexy companies, small companies. <laughs> Like you've got it all. And so I'm just really excited to dig into the topic, but wanted everybody to get to know you so we can read a lot to you. But what are the things about Brandon that we can't read that would be good for our community to hear? Oh, man, I knew you were going to throw me a curveball. Um, yeah, so first of all, uh, I'm super excited to be here doing this. Um, and and in particular with you, Anita, like you, like you mentioned, we've partnered together quite a bit over the past better part of a decade now and seen a lot. And so it's exciting for me. Um, what are what are some of the things that, that you, you can't read about me on LinkedIn or uh, in in certain posts, I guess? Um, well, you're right. Like I've, I've been lucky enough to see a lot of the, a lot of difference in the companies I've worked for, larger at scale, smaller startups, pre-IPO, going through IPO. Um, but even with all that aside, like the, 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 I think what makes me, me and drive engagement for me is just the human connection. And, and that's something that um, I think you can probably pick up on when you look at people's profiles, but uh, even more so when you get a chance to engage with them live. And so I'm, I'm hoping that's what comes across today uh, most, if anything, if you take anything away from me being here is that uh, I believe in being people first in everything I do uh, and and letting kind of the chips fall from there. And I'm sure we'll talk more about that at some point. You know, it's so true in working with you, Brandon, I always admire that you care about your team first. You, you can do the job and put in process and systems and all the things, but all of your teams love working with you. Like there's never been a time where I haven't been working with you or side by side or just in the same, you know, community and everybody loves working with you. And I think that shows the amount of care and love that you have for your team, which you can't get a degree in. So like, as you talk about career path and progression, you know, fewer than one in 10 HR leaders have an HR specific degree. Nearly one third, though, have a non HR or business degree, which means you can come from about anywhere. So, can you share a little bit more on the paths and routes to becoming an HR leader? Do you think um, Do you think we're just going to completely go away from HR leaders having specific HR degrees? Um, well, I think we're already seeing that, right? The the, the stat shows that. Um, and I don't know that I've ever posted a, a role for an HR business partner where we've said, hey, it's required that you have a four-year degree in you know, organizational design or, or people or business or anything like that. It's, it's really been more about um, their path, 
what 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 they stand for, their values, the principles, how they kind of impact the business and, and think of that. And so um, I, I think we'll continue to see that trend where the, the traditional HR um, degree doesn't matter as much. Not to say it doesn't matter. I think education, that's one thing that I want to be careful about is, is I don't want anybody to hear that education isn't important, that certification isn't important, continuing education isn't, because it is. I, I just don't think that there's one path. And so, you know, I shared earlier that I, um, I studied anthropology, uh, never ever in my, you know, growing up, never said, hey, someday I want to be a recruiter or an HR professional. It was, it was probably more along the lines of, you know, I want to be a veterinarian or a pilot or whatever, right? Um, but uh, as I was, as I fell into recruiting, which I think a lot of recruiters kind of find their way in it, in that way, um, I just fell in love also with being able to impact how people um, can better you know, it kind of improve their own situation and uh, upgrade their lives through finding better employment opportunities. And at the same time, it's a win for the company because you're bringing amazing talent that, that, that delivers for for them as well. And so, um, so the short answer is no. Yes, I think we'll continue to see it move away from just one path, and we already are. Well, and I think, you know, Carissa makes a good point. She just, just completed her master's in HR from Temple University and found the program really beneficial. So I think there's two sides, right? Brandon is sure I'm certified. I am not. Um, like I don't have a formal HR um, undergrad. I have a master's in organizational behavior, more the psychology piece. But part of it is like, how do we apply it? Eleanor asks a great question. Does it help weed through the open roles? Like, is it a disqualifier? And then also, do we need to apply pressure on SHRM and universities to offer better, more relevant education, right? Because I think we're saying education is important. And I'd love to see in the chat where you all feel you've gotten your best education about things that help you impact your day job. Um, because, you know, part of what Brandon and I have talked about is being a student of the business. That seems to be the skill set that we're really looking for. And so, Brandon, I'm curious, you know, if one out of four managers, according to our state of HR survey, have a professional certification, where is the education coming from? And how do you become kind of a student of the business like we've been talking about? And where can they help continue to grow their themselves on their career path? Yeah, so I mean, I, I agree, and like, like I was trying to be clear that the education is—it's not that it's not important, and and I, I think having that any experience that you can get is crucial. Good. I think so. You come out of a master's degree, and and to the extent that that is beneficial to you, I think yeah, all for it and kudos. But how do you take that and then actually apply it in a way that is going to bring the most value? to the company that you're working for. So I think that, that that's really what I meant by that. So I think, um, yeah, it, it, the, the education really comes with, like you mentioned, the, the term that we, we've been talking about being a student of the business. Uh, I think that is the crucial piece, right? And for me, one of what, when I first started doing in-house recruiting, it was at uh, EA, video game company. And uh, I knew nothing about building video game studios and, you know, 3D artists and environment artists versus character artists and all these different tools. And so uh, what I did that was really helpful for me was uh, just get in under the hood with each of these partners that I worked with and, and move my desk even to sit alongside them to the extent yeah. that it wasn't disruptive, but just really try to understand what does a day in a life look like and, and what are their quarterly initiatives and goals and and how does it connect back to the mission and oh by the way like when we're looking at uh, artist portfolios you know what are you looking for and what does look good look like and and what does not so good look like and just trying to to your point be a student and educate myself and I think those are the real-time things that uh if you do that uh you're gonna just add to whatever formal or informal education you bring I think that's so true. And you can see here in the chat, it is just a good 
it's everybody's done different things. I really love, you know, there's feedback here around applying back to an MBA program, which I think if we talk about being a student of the business, the MBA is a great rounded out piece. I love what you're saying about doing, I call it train rides, where you sit next to the business leader, you listen to support calls, you listen to sales calls, you go around and you sit down as they're, if you're in a technology company and you watch them code into the product. Um, if you're working with truck drivers, you're in and you're driving the truck with them and figuring out how that works. But just really learning who your customers are as internal team members um, it's such a great way to learn. And you've got to think about how you learn best too, and what your mode is of learning. Mine is learn by doing. I don't really learn by reading or by listening. I've got to do it in action. Um, so know what your learning mode is and be able to apply it out there. But what do you think, Brandon, about you know early career? Do you need time both at an enterprise size business and a startup? Or what are the benefits that you see at, you know, because you've worked at small, you've worked at large. What have been the benefits to you in your career path on, on both sides of that equation? Yeah. Let, let me let me back up real quick because yeah. I feel like I didn't address there's some things in the in the chat about certifications. And you mentioned that. I have a certification, right? I have the SPHR. Um, and, and I think those are valuable. Uh, again, I think all education is valuable. I didn't start out with certification. I didn't go and take that until I had probably, I don't know, eight to 10 years of, of experience. And the reason I did it was really from a continuing education. And I wanted to challenge myself. You know, I, I knew I didn't have this formal HR education track. Um, you know, I'd been put in some interesting positions to learn and, and this will tie into your next you know, the question you just asked. Um, so I, I think the certifications are great. Um, I, I think that they are helpful and but but like anything else, what, what's the motivator? They're all very personal reasons why we either go get a master's, um, go decide to get a, a certain certificate because we feel like it's going to benefit us either personally or professionally. And so I think that would be just the 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 finer point that I would want to put on it. I think that's um, a, a great yeah. point because like uh, just to, so we're still here because there's so many good questions in here. Um, you know, do you think if someone wants to become an HR leader, they need to have a master's degree or higher? And I don't I don't think that's the case. Um, the benefit of my master's degree was actually I already got hired in as an HR professional as my first HR job reporting to the CEO for 100 people in the construction industry. And I was telling Brandon and the team yesterday in our prep that I cried every night when I went home because I just oversold on my ability to deliver in this job. And so I went to University of Phoenix. It was local. I had to go to school at night. It was a night program paid for it by myself. And the benefit of that program for me is that it was taught by people in the field. And so at the time, you know, Intel was a leader in leadership and HR practices. Medtronic was also a leader in HR practices. And I got connected right with um, leaders in their HR group at those organizations. So I could call them and say, hey, teach me how to do this, or how do I learn how to do this? And the benefit of that degree was the networking into not professors, but into people that are actually living the day job. That was the benefit. So I think you could find education. Yeah. And to your point, like the benefit of some of the certifications is the networking. The benefit of the master's or undergrad program is the networking of people doing the job. And I would look at that. And if you don't um, have the time or the resources to go get those certifications, I think Brandon and I are both examples of being really scrappy and finding ways for free education through strong mentorship and a good network of people that you can call and say, hey, I've never done this before. How do I do that? Because that's also great education. Yeah, yeah, that that's great. Um, so going back to your question about uh, large companies versus small, like that is exactly where I got my education around this, you know. And and I had to come at it from a place of just being hungry and wanting to learn and and um, acknowledging what I did know as much as or more, you know, acknowledging what I didn't know, right? And being willing to um, lean into those areas and find mentors and um, you know, I, I started my recruiting career on the agency side, which was a whole different ballgame and uh, very much a sales kind of motion. You're going out and finding candidates to place within companies and and then like 
you know, you've got a quota to hit, and then the next month it kind of resets to zero, and you're doing that same thing over and over again. Uh, for me, what was missing, one, it was very transactional, which yeah. I didn't love. Uh, secondly, I just felt like, okay, what's the back half of this journey for these folks that I'm putting into these amazing companies? Like, I, I just want to know what happens and how how do they perform and how do they succeed and what's their experience like? And, and you just, you don't see that, right, on the agency side. And so uh, I was lucky enough to get be given the opportunity to go in-house um, for EA, like I mentioned. And um, like that was a springboard for me to everything else. And, and, and I'll say when I went, when I joined EA, and th this is also a point I wanted to make is you have to be willing, I think, to take the right amount of risk for you. Yes. To, to, to get this education. That risk might mean you're spending money to get a master's degree. In my case, that risk meant I'm going in to this opportunity EA and it's a contract opportunity, leaving a full-time job. They can't guarantee me a full-time spot. So I had to weigh the, the, the pros and cons. Okay. And for me, the pros outweighed the cons. I thought, hey, you know what? If this only lasts six months and I have to go back to agency recruiting, it will still be worth it. There'll still be a great logo on my resume and I'll take it as a learning experience. Um, well, that didn't happen. You know, I, I ended up, uh, mm -hmm. when I left EA, I was running all recruiting for them globally for all of their development studios. And so, um, you know, for me, like it was just an opportunity to get in, be hungry and learn, find some mentors and just build my knowledge around that. But also like deliver what I knew I could. Like I knew I could deliver hiring and talent and so focusing on what I was good at while um, surrounding myself with people that could help me be kind of a student of the business. That's awesome. And so there's a great question here. If I just fell into the HR field, what's the most important role that a newbie should learn first? You know, as you've had these experiences in these organizations, big and small, Brandon, if somebody's just coming in, where would you advise they learn first? Um <clears throat> That's a good question. I, I think it depends on where you kind of landed because there are so many different swim lanes within HR, right? There's there's comp and bin, there's the business partner function, there's talent acquisition, so on and, and so forth. But I think the common thread across all of these things is, um, your, is business acumen. No matter what spot you're in, I would say learn and know what the company does that you work for, how they build their product, how they go to market with the product, um, you know, this, all the strategy. Like I think too often, at least historically, HR professionals, they, they, because we're so busy, we just see it like tunnel vision as the work in front of us. But our ability to connect the dots across to what the business is trying to achieve and each department's objectives and trying to help the, the company attain that and also knowing hey who are our competitors in the field what are they doing um what sets them apart where are we shining i think just building your business acumen no matter what part of hr you live in is is a good place to start and, and it's an ongoing thing i don't think you ever reach the mountaintop there because the market and and industries change so frequently yeah, I want to dig in on this one. So I think recruiting is a great place to start because then you start to learn the business of HR while you're becoming a student of the business by learning about these roles and the different roles that are high volume roles, the specific roles to an organization. So I think you can start to, to learn a lot by scheduling or calendaring or sourcing. You know, I think those are great places to start to gain the acumen, Brandon, that I hear you talking about being a student of the business. You know, I remember you and I were hiring for a comp analyst once and I would do these interviews and I would always ask the comp analyst wherever they were working. I'd say, tell me about where you're working and, you know, how you make your money, how you build your product, how you go to market, all of those things. And I was in an interview and, and the candidate said, I don't know why you'd ask me that. And I said, well, I don't know you how you price a job if you don't know how you build your products. Like, and this is what's so interesting about HR. There's no other role really inside the business that has to know everything about the business from soup to nuts like HR does. And if you're going to come and price roles, 
and be a compensation analyst, you have to know intimately what those jobs do. Otherwise, your customer hiring managers will never believe that your comp is in the right ballpark to go and hire those team members competitively. So I just think it's a it's a good point as we think about where you're starting and what you're learning and how to kind of gain gain that acumen for sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you can you can connect that idea to any position within HR. You know, business partners. I mean, how are you going to go in and provide guidance around um, you know performance management and leveling up the team and skills gap analysis if you really don't have a good understanding of, you know, what what that team does and what the business does, and a day in a life, right? Like I mentioned earlier, I think that was that was the the, the changing point for me when I just started to um, not worry so much about uh, what does my nine to five or nine to six look like as a recruiter, but just I want to learn about what these folks do. For sure, for sure, and then I just. I, I, one, one thing I was just going to jump into this uh, question that Sarah asked about, you know, how, how you find or have you found uh, mentors externally? I mean, it, it's a good question. I don't know that there's any one silver bullet. It's a multifaceted approach and then it's already answered like they're key. But, you know, LinkedIn is an amazing resource. That's, that's been a resource for me over the years. There are a lot of professional organizations out there that you can join and, and network with. Um, and, and the, you know, what I, I did a lot of is would, would connect with fellow recruiters throughout the Mountain West region or even wherever we were working. When we jumped into like Dublin, for example, and didn't know a lot about recruiting there, um, we started uh, making connections with uh, like their version of the Chamber of Commerce, other companies that had been, that are, were doing what we were trying to do and I found everyone to be incredibly gracious with their time. So uh, I think you just have to um, get resourceful. Luckily, we live in an age where it's at your fingertips for the most part and uh, make those connections. Yeah, that's those are great tips. You know, some things I've done too is when I first started in tech and I had not really hired in volume ever before. Um, and I looked up companies that I admired I looked up companies of cultures that I wanted to learn from. I looked up companies that were hiring well and volume and retaining those team members. So at the time, I remember every quarter, I would go out to the Bay Area and I would send messages on LinkedIn before. And I sent a note to the CHRO at Shutterfly at the time and said, hey, I'm going to be in town. Would you give me 30 minutes to talk about these three things? How do you hire at volume, retain your people and continue to maintain a strong culture? And so I would send those things in advance. And I rarely, Brandon, to your point, had people that would tell me no. I went to Nike. I went to Atlassian. Um, you know, went to a number of different places and then just started building that relationship. And um, some great advice is, you know, I'm going to San Francisco next week for a dinner. And I always make sure that I meet with somebody out there before, after I'm like, who wants to meet me for a drink before who wants to meet me for dessert afterwards and continue to build those relationships of people that are out there um, in person, you know, same thing. I'm going to Las Vegas the next week. And I'm like, who can I see in Las Vegas? Um, that's been a good mentor somebody that I want to learn from and make sure that I schedule time with them. And now you don't have to travel to go do those things. You can ask for a zoom call, but I know when people ask me, it's oftentimes not specific enough. It's like, I just want to get to know you and your path. And I would encourage you to be really specific on what you want to learn. And when you do that, I think people are really apt to say, yes, I can help you with that or I can introduce you to somebody that can help you with that that's right yeah I love that I, I love that you are you're very intentional with with why you want to meet it's not just hey I would love to connect with you right, right? I, these are the things that I want to learn and you know so I love that um I think you asked me something before I derailed us uh about working at smaller versus larger companies. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Like what, what are your thoughts there? I, I mean, I love both. Yeah. I, I love both for very different reasons. And, um, you know, I started larger with larger companies. I think at the time EA was about 15,000 employees. I mean, uh, not on the scale of Salesforce or anything, but, but, but big, right. Big enough and, and global all over the world. Um, 
I, I think I'm glad that's where I started. And again, this is where I think everybody's journey is personal. Um, I, I was, I'm glad looking back that I started there because it, it gave me this framework at scale that I think I probably needed. Um, you know, I learned that, in my opinion, what good or great really looked like in regards to employer branding, uh, branding in general, world, world-class marketing teams, um, you know, uh, uh, talent acquisition, global talent acquisition function with all the pieces that lie within it, university recruiting, you know, all of those things. And um, I got, I got a, a crash course on like, like things like GDPR and, and, and recruiting wow. in the Nordics versus Germany versus France and uh, to me, that was that. That's what I. That's a little more of color around like what I mean by that education. That for me was so invaluable. That didn't come from necessarily a master's program or a certificate. Um, and then I was lucky enough to go see kind of the opposite side of that. You know, startup world, pre-IPO, um, and, and and I felt like I was able to bring some of those amazing learnings um, because often what at least in my experience, again, my, my own experience, when I went to some of these smaller companies, they wanted somebody who had seen this at scale, that had seen it two to three clicks ahead of where they're at, um, that could help them see around some of these corners. And so that's why for me, it was the, the career path, it was really beneficial the way that it happened because, you know, in startup world, you are much more scrappier. Uh, uh, most of these pieces and teams and frameworks aren't built out. Uh, and so you, it, it, you know, it can be a challenge if you're going in and trying to learn that for the first time in that world. At the same time, I, I've got a buddy who his first gig, and I think much like yours, Anita, you can speak to this as well, was in a smaller company and, and, and he's done exceptionally, exceptionally well. So uh, I'm, I'm grateful I've been able to see both sides of it. I've since been more in kind of that startup or smaller company environment. And that's where I've uh, played, uh, so to speak, over the past 10 years at this point. Yeah. Or at least, well, man, six, seven plus years. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it's a good point because there are pros and cons. Like in a small organization, what I hear you saying is you get to play every position on the field. And a larger right. organization, you get to be more specific around the roles that you do. And, you know, I think it depends on what you want to be as a leader, right? Do you want to be the best head of recruiting any organization has ever had? Do you want to run the function? Do you want to be like a head of business partners? Um, you know, I like I like the head of function because I, I like to play in all the places and spaces, um, but I also think to do that, you need to be kind of, you have to be able to pinch hit. I mean, Brandon knows this because we worked on the same team for so long. I'm ahead of something every time because there's always something happening on the team. So you've got to be able to step in and take one of the specific roles at any given time. Like we have a mutual friend that got offered a head of people job at a small organization, less than a hundred people. And our question, both Brandon and I talked to him and said, you know, are you going to be a head of recruiting and it's covered by the head of people role? Or are you really going to be a head of people or a head of HR? And are you really prepared to do that? Are you deep on business partnership? Are you deep in compensation and benefits? Are you deep in, we knew he was deep in, you know, one of those areas, but maybe not all of those areas. So um, just good things to consider, but part of deciding big or small is who you want to be and what you want to learn. So our advice was him is to get into a bigger organization where you start to learn all those functions and grow up in them, and then you can take the top job. Yeah, yeah, I I, I agree with that. But again, like that was the path that that I took, and I think the other thing that um, I mean, it really matters. The company makes a difference. I think we can all agree on that. Like what in how they see the people function, if they really see it valuable, the, the leader within the people function, whether it's the CPO or CHRO, whatever their title is, uh, matters immensely. And, and I was, uh, I feel like I was blessed with some great leaders early on that really pushed me, um, even though I was specialized in recruiting, to think like a business partner and yeah. not just like a transactional recruiter. And so I think, you know, that that was also really important because if you are in 
startup world, like to your point, Anita, you're going to wear all the hats anyway. And if you already know how to think like a business partner in all those different scenarios, um, I mean, you just bring immense value. It's for sure, for sure. Um, great comments here on networking in the chat. So if you haven't captured all the notes here, lots of great ideas on where you can go network. And I also don't want to ignore Dennis. You have a question up here, and I'm not sure I'm really capturing the spirit of it. How do we define a highly paid HR employee as a leader? In light of today's news, would we call the head of HR at Twitter a leader? And I just um, I want to make sure that we're answering that question specifically. I don't know who the head of HR at Twitter is, but I guess my 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 thought is that. I don't really love to be judgmental against anyone's practices. Everybody does practices that they feel are best in the state of the business that they're in. And so if I don't agree with them, I like to ask myself the question why I don't think it's effective or why I do think it's effective. And I like to look at it from their standpoint of what they may be trying to achieve that I can't see. Um, and just because you're highly paid to me doesn't make you a leader. I know right. I see amazing, <laughs> amazing interns lead better than some senior directors. Um, and so title and pay grade is completely agnostic to effective leadership. And so those are those are my two cents for you, Brandon. Would you add anything else to Dennis's question here? No, I, I don't I don't know about the Twitter thing either, but I agree wholeheartedly that money has nothing to do with leadership. Like that, that's why in, in every job description that I push out, I try to be super intentional around the work you'll be doing and how you do the work, right? It's, it's the what and the how for me and, and just echoing what you say there, Anita. So this is, you know, the next kind of point we're getting into here is we did sign, find some really interesting data points outside of the Bamboo HR report that talk about the growth of HR. So the number of HR specialist jobs is expected to grow by 8%. That is faster than the overall average job growth and means there could be over 58,000 more HR specialist jobs. I'm curious what you think about this growth in this area, Brandon, and what you think is driving that type of growth. Well, you know, I have my theories. I, I, I think it, it's not surprising to me um, what I think is driving, it, it may feel a little surprising just given the market we're in, right? But but I, what doesn't surprise me is that there's more demand um, for these types of strategic thought partners. And, and I think that what, what's probably evolved over time is that it, HR has gone from more of a personnel department yeah. um, where it was back in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s and maybe even still today in some places but now is actually seen more as uh, a strategic business uh, hire, right? The, like the, I think the companies that get it realize that the chief people officer, the, the head of HR is equally as important as a strategic business hire as like the CMO. Um, and so I think that, and, and without knowing a lot more around like the, the data and the granularity there, that would be my theory as to what's driving it. I think you're right. I mean, I think this is, um, you know, an awesome opportunity for HR professionals because the environment is recognizing the impact that HR can have on the business. And so, you know, I think, um, you know, this next section, we want to talk about career tips for the HR team of one, because many of you who are Bamboo customers or in our Bamboo community are HR teams of one. And you know that we all think you're heroes. And that's what this podcast is dedicated to help supporting each of you in your own role. And, you know, what's kind of the advice if there's more people coming into this area, there's more companies adding a team of one. We saw that, you know, 35% of um, startups have dedicated HR support. So it seems like that's growing. Um, how do you get advice? How do you stay focused if you're an HR team of one? And how do you stay out of just recruiting, right? Because if you're a team of one and you've got open recs, that's artful. So what's your advice, Brandon, on how how these teams of ones continue to be effective and where they go for help? Hmm. That's a good question. I, I think you have to um, I think you have to just really shamelessly prioritize your world. 
Um, otherwise, you will get caught up in all the other pieces that are urgent, but maybe not as important. And right. so I think you've got to be, you, you've got to get good at prioritization. Um, and, and the only way that you can do that is, again, going back to understanding the business. I think being in alignment with your partners and leaders as to what is both urgent and important. Um, what's going to move the needle most for the business might be hiring this particular function or this leader this quarter. It might be looking at um, what's our comp philosophy, whatever it is, right? I think you've got to get clear on, on the most important thing that you can accomplish for the business in that given time period. Uh, and then you're, you're going to have to have a team, uh, kind of a team approach to a lot of these things. As a, as a HR team of one, you can't do it all, you gotta prioritize, and then you've gotta enlist help. Um, so for example, you know that hiring manager who needs to hire that SDR might have to do a lot more of the heavy lifting than if we had a, a recruiter on the team today, which we don't, right? So I think it's, it's, it's recognizing the most important things that need to be done, aligning around them, um, and then, figuring out how do we divide and conquer on getting these things done, um, you know, with, with, with the team that we have in place. Yeah, I think no matter whether you're on a team of one, a small team or a larger team, being a ruthless prioritizer, is, there, is that a word? Can you be a ruthless yeah. prioritizer? <laughs> I um, think you can be a ruthless anything. <laughs> You've got to be ruthless at prioritizing because there's always more demand than there is supply in this job. Always. And so the goal of what I hear you saying, Brandon, is that you've got to be clear on what you're there to do and what you're there to not do. You know, so I see frustration in the chat. Please chime in if if you share it of, you know, there's more demand than supply, what the demand is and how you can be able to say, hey, I think the top three most important things for me to deliver on right now is this, this and this. And if you want me to do something else, what are we going to take off the plate and and partner with me in that? And while I love all the conversation and, and passion for SHRM, don't overlook the mentorship and support from that peer leadership team inside your organization. Because I think if you're managing a team, you're an HR leader, right? Because you've got to lead a team and you're responsible for these humans. So if you feel alone, go and get those other leaders who are leading shoulder to shoulder with you and get them to understand your priorities, help you lead through them, and help them shoulder the responsibility of taking care of our most important asset, our humans. Um, and that will help you no matter what size team team you're on. What do you think, Brandon? Yeah, I, I agree. And I love the comments that are coming in where, and trust me, I identify with what Norma says, where my value is based on recruiting. <laughs> I mean, granted, that's the world I live in, but um, but even, even without it, I think, you know, the, the importance is, like you said, Anita, well, if that's where they're placing the value, then clearly that's where we should prioritize our time. And then it becomes an exercise in prioritization and asking them, oh, what are you okay with me pushing to next quarter? Or what are you okay from this list uh, that doesn't get done right now in favor of what we all agree I should clear my calendar for? Um, and and so yeah, I, I think that that's right. I'm just I'm looking at some of the comments here. Yeah, train up your managers and supervisors to handle basic HR duties. 100% agree. Like part of being a people leader is just that, right? Like you are leading people, and there are parts of what, what I think people might consider HR duties that that they need to be um, responsible for. Recruit. They need to know how to interview well. They need to. Know, need to know how to recruit and hire. Um, they're a part of that process. Even if you have a recruiter uh, partnered up with them, they should really be kind of co-authoring, co-porter backing that whole process anyway. So definitely, definitely. I'm curious, here's here's an interesting question of considering companies' current attempts to return to office, do you have a sense how important this will be seen for the HR and people ops roles? Ooh. Man, that one, we could probably spend an hour on that one alone. Um, I, I don't know. Gosh, that's a tough one. I think that there's real value in getting FaceTime. I don't think it's the same as on a Zoom screen. In right. fact, for me personally, 
I live about an hour away from the office. I don't go in very often. I maybe, but I do make it a point to try to go in once a week at minimum. And I notice a difference. And it was almost unsettling the, when we started meeting in person again versus Zoom. It was like, wow, this is weird to be like tangibly across the table from somebody. And and I didn't like that it felt that way. And, and so it just was kind of an eye opener for me. So I think there's value in getting FaceTime. Do I think people have to be in every day? No. I think, you know, I've had most of my recruiting team have been remote from me um, and, and globally distributed. And so I, I think that there it's not necessary and you can do a lot of things to keep people connected and make sure they don't feel like they're on an island. But, but I think even pre-COVID, right, there was a reason why companies would fly everybody in for, you know, sales kickoffs or something like that, because that in-person FaceTime um, there, really? there's really no replacement for it. That's so true. That's so true. So the last section we have, and we'll go through it really quickly, but in the spirit of, you know, career advice, Brandon, how long should we stay in each role that we're in? Like, what's your thought there? Forever and <laughs> ever. <laughs> you know, nearly half, 48% have stayed more than seven years. I was super surprised by that. Um, you know, 76 of enterprise HR managers have worked at their current employer for three years or more. So the tenure inside HR tends to be tends to be fairly strong. You know, the majority of HR managers at startups, 83% have been at their current employer for three years or fewer. So it's definitely different in the startup world to the to the enterprise world, but the data is definitely interesting, showing that we're staying longer than other industries. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's any right answer to that. Personally, yeah. you know, I've I've been at places uh, for a year. I've been at places for three years. I've been at places for you know five plus years. Um, that's one of those things that's kind of a personal. I think you have to take personal assessment of like w what it is. What are your motivators? You know, and and at what point? I think most people know at what point they feel like they've accomplished what they came to accomplish. They feel good about it being time to move on, or maybe they're not, um, you know, learning and growing the extent that they feel like they need to. So, so I think it's a very personal um, thing to, to determine, but I will say with, within HR, I don't think it's unique to HR, but I think in particular with HR, a lot of things don't move very quickly. So I have a hard time um, envisioning somebody coming in and if they've only been there for six months, like they've really uh, rolled out these programs or maybe moved the needle. And and again, like there are so many variables as to why somebody leaves. You know, I think we've all stepped in to a place where we felt like, ugh, maybe I made a mistake here or whatever. Right? And, and and so there's no judgment around that. So I think the bottom line is there's no there's no wrong or right answer to it. I think it really is about personal motivators and the environment you're in, whether it's healthy for you and your career and what you're trying to accomplish. And, um, and ultimately, I think most of us, uh, I don't want to speak for all of us, but you know, at least I do, I want to find a place that I can land at and spend an indefinite amount of time. There's no shelf life on when I join a company. Um, I want to come in, I want to bring value, provide value, deliver on, 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 on what I signed up for. And you know, then kind of let let the, the path take its own course. And I trust my own judgment on when it's time to go or if I end up staying the rest of my career then. Yeah, I think it's great advice. You know, it depends on if the role continues to be challenging and engaging. Tell us, like, it depends on the nature of the business. You know, just lots of different things to add in. And your own personal health and well-being is a big part of it, too. You feel like you're challenged and growing. Can you meet your personal goals and commitments by staying in a job? I mean, you and I have many discussions, and one of our commitments to each other is that we stay healthy and happy in our whole life, not just in our work life, which I'm super grateful for. So we can both help each other be stronger in all of our commitments, not just as our commitments as leaders in Bamboo. And that makes a big difference. Um, for me to stay is having somebody like you to work with every day. Yeah, well, thank you. I'm, I, I feel the same way, you know, and, and 
like to me, that's the priority at this stage of my career is um, it's not so much money motivated. It's more motivated by the work I get to do and who I get to do it with. Um, that was different. It was different for me 10, 15 years ago yeah. when I was up and comer and, you know, I had a young family and I wanted to try to increase my, my, my place in my, in my, and, and my tax, I guess my tax level or what bracket, that's what, that's what bracket, I was looking yeah. for, right? Yeah. You know, so I think, again, it's, it's whatever you're personally motivated by, I think sometimes you stay somewhere. I've seen this too, not even within HR, but outside of HR in different departments where somebody's been somewhere so long that they don't even know what they're worth on the market. Right. And as soon as they find out, they're like, look how I can go do this and, and make another $30,000. Man, I, I wish no. that I hope they do that. Because again, yeah. this is like, this isn't all about just the company. This is about you and taking care of yourself and finding that balance between um, those two pieces, I think. Yeah. Well, Brandon, this was so much fun. Thank you so much for joining our community here today. So many great lessons. Um, you know, just to summarize, because we want to make sure that you take away actionable items out of our time together. Here's some of the things I learned from Brandon today is that one, you know, think about what education matters to the role. We all agree education is important. Figure out what kind of education you need based on what type of HR leader you want to be and go, go get that. And a big part of education is mentorship. So reach out and find those people that you admire at those organizations and be specific about how you ask them for help and advice. You can learn as much as you want from a small company versus a big company, again, depending on who you want to be and where you're going in your career. If you're a team of one, don't be alone. Leverage that, that team inside the organization and reach out to your community to help provide support and guidance. And, you know, just continue to think about how long you should stay in the role if you're meeting all of the needs that are important to you as an individual. So, Brandon, I've learned so much. Thank you so much for your time and for joining us today. Yeah, thank, thank you. The last thing I'll add to that, Anita, is like, the, the success and failure of any company or business, you should never feel like that rests on your shoulders alone. And so that's why it's so important to um, build those relationships, bring people along the journey with you that can be great mentors, find opportunities to network and, and, and you know, approach it. If you really are a team of one, like that team mentality is going to be so crucial. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, come back and join us on March 30th for our next episode, how to make employee onboarding as a top priority. We can recruit them all day long, Brandon, but if we don't onboard them, we're just shooting ourselves in the foot, right? Yeah, that hole in the bucket. That's a killer. It is a killer. <laughs> so register for our webinar at hrunplug.com. All the links are here and follow up with us in the HR Hero Slack channel. We'll post the link. You can watch the recording. And um, if you want to share anything else with Brandon or me, we're here for you. We're here to provide any help and guidance because you're our heroes and we're grateful for the time. So have a super afternoon. Thanks again, Brandon. Hey, thank you, Anita. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Take care.